My name is Madeline Fortier, and I'm the Speakers Director of the Buckley Program. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Yale professor Peter Shuck, who will be moderating our third panel of the day on the topic, Federalism and the Modern Administrative State. Peter Shuck is the Simeon E. Baldwin Professor of Law Emeritus at Yale University. He has held this chair since 1984, served briefly as Deputy Dean of the Law School, and took emeritus status in 2009. His major fields of teaching and research are law and public policy, tort law, immigration law, and administrative law. His most recent books include Why Government Fails So Often and How It Can Do Better, and Understanding America, the Institutions and Policies that Shape America and the World. Professor Shuck holds degrees from Cornell University, Harvard Law School, NYU Law School, and Harvard uh, University. He lives in New York City and now teaches periodically at NYU Law School. Please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Shuck. <laughs> thanks very much, and, and thanks to the Buckley Program for uh, sponsoring this uh, wonderful event. Uh, I'm just the moderator. I'm not going to speak for very long, particularly since I uh, misplaced my notes. So, <laughs> But I thought uh, what I would do is to um, uh, introduce the panel uh, both individually but also sort of thematically by identifying some of the key concepts that will be discussed by the panelists. Uh, they will, of course, elaborate on these concepts, but I, I thought I would save them a little bit of time by just defining uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the major uh, categories. So, um, first of all, this is about the administrative state, and uh, I understand there are a lot of undergraduates in the audience, and they may not be familiar with that, um, but uh, the administrative state is simply the arrangements under which um, the Congress has delegated authority uh, to agencies uh, to undertake certain exercises of lawmaking, uh, which uh, conservatives, uh, particularly Federal Society uh, uh, supporters, tend to believe is unconstitutional. And uh, Philip Hamburger, uh, one of our uh, panelists, is going to uh, explain why that's the case. Uh, the administrative state is different than the deep state, at least in my mind. The deep state is a term that's been used to characterize uh, the federal government and in particular to claim that um, there is a kind of conspiracy or at least a system under which um, unelected officials um, drive the wheels of policy and, and make uh, key decisions and are um, not uh, prone to the kinds of mechanisms of accountability that our Constitution um, ordains. I don't know if anybody's going to mention the deep state, but I thought it might come up, and, uh, and uh, so I, I've defined it, no doubt, over simply. Um, the, another uh, uh, point, uh, uh, another theme that will come up is um, preemption. Preemption is the body of doctrine that derives from uh, the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution in Article 6, um, which uh, holds that the, uh, basically that the lawmaking by Congress and by the federal courts, um, and it's also been interpreted to apply to the federal agencies, uh, preempt uh, inconsistent law um, enacted by uh, states or localities, or even private action that is inconsistent with the federal um, uh, responsibility un under the Supremacy Clause broadly defined. And uh, some of our speakers are no doubt going to uh, maintain that the preemption power, which is a very important one uh, because it eliminates state and local alternatives to federal programs and approaches, um, has been interpreted much too broadly. So we'll, uh, we'll hear about that. Um, the Commerce Clause is... Uh, a clause, an uh, uh, extremely important clause in Article I of the Constitution, which provides that uh, Congress has uh, the sole authority to regulate commerce among the states uh, with foreign countries and uh, with uh, the Indian tribes. And uh, some of, one of our speakers is going to be discussing uh, uh, the Commerce Clause 
uh, as well. Um, so, um, oh, the, the other concept uh, that will come up is the non-delegation doctrine. The non-delegation doctrine uh, derives from a Supreme Court decision uh, about uh, 80 years ago, um, which has uh, uh, that which prescribed that the um, Congress has only limited powers to uh, delegate authority to uh, the administrative agencies, and it has to do so through uh, clear rules. And so, um, uh, conservatives tend to maintain that the uh, that the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, is routinely violated in the design and the implementation of the uh, administrative state. So uh, we'll hear about that. Uh, now I'll just uh, mention our, our speakers in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Nicholas Quinton Rosencrantz, um, uh, who is immediately to my right, is a professor at uh, Georgetown University Law Center. He's a constitutional scholar of uh, some eminence, uh, particularly in the area of uh, uh, constitutional law, foreign affairs, powers, and uh, the administrative state. Um, he uh, clerked for Justice Kennedy uh, and is a, a leading uh, figure in the conservative, conservative professoriate. Uh, Philip Hamburger is a law professor at Columbia. Uh, he is a legal historian, but in recent years has turned to uh, uh, administrative law and uh, uh, will maintain uh, quite energetically, as he has in several books, that the administrative state is, in fact, unconstitutional um, and uh, uh, is indeed, as in the title of his re most recent book, a threat. Um, Adam uh, White um, is a, a, a fellow, research fellow at the Hoover Institution, and he is on the faculty uh, of the um, Anthony Scalia uh, School of Law at George Mason University, and he is the research director uh, for the Center for on the Administrative State. And I may there's probably other words in that. The Center for the Study of the Administrative Center State. Center for it's the Study. The, <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> so uh, I will give them uh, about 15 minutes each. Uh, I will uh, keep the time with a rigor that. Uh, uh, the Supreme Court would enforce, um, but uh, actually I can only do through, that per, through persuasion. But each of them have about 15 minutes, and hopefully that'll leave time for Q&A and uh, perhaps some interaction among the panelists. Thank you. Nick? Uh, great. Thank you. I'm delighted to uh, be here. Thank you, Peter. And I especially want to thank the William F. Buckley program at Yale. I think this is a hugely valuable and important organization as you may know there are 4,410 professors here at Yale University, and the number of those who donated to a Republican candidate in the last primary season was three. There were three that uh, did that, so it's, I think, um, valuable for an organization to try to um, bring uh, a bit of intellectual diversity to the Yale community. So thank you to the Buckley Program for uh, that. Um, so federalism in the administrative state, this is a kind of a tricky audience to talk to. I know we have a bunch of undergrads here, but we also have a bunch of some of the most preeminent constitutional uh, scholars in the country. So a little tricky um, to how to quite pitch the talk. I'm going to be um, saying some quite basic things in order to lay some uh, groundwork uh, for the more provocative comments that I think will follow. Um, hopefully this will be of use to some of you in the audience and um, Randy Barnett, Michael McConnell, feel free to like check your email or whatever, it's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, um, federalism. This is the idea that uh, the federal government would be um, limited to certain things that it would be in charge of and most things would be done by the states. And the theory, the constitutional mechanism for that idea is that the federal government is a government of limited powers. In Article 1, Section 8, we get a list. And that list is the list of powers of Congress. And if it's not within that list, then it's um, not within the congressional purview. And it's supposed to be left to the states. 
And the idea was that was going to be uh, some discrete things, and most things were going to be done by the states. That was the original sort of founder's vision of the thing. As my mentor, Yale Law Professor Akhil Mar, was uh, often pointed out, um, you know, from the perspective of the framing generation, they just weren't that worried about state governments. The state governments had been around for a while. As he liked to point out, the um, the you know Massachusetts House of Burgesses or whatever had been around for longer to them than the 14th Amendment has to us. So it's, they, they weren't worried really about their state governments. They were worried about this new federal government and quite what it was going to be up to. Um, Witness, by the way, uh, in Barron v. Baltimore, the Supreme Court points out um, the Bill of Rights doesn't actually bind the states. It just binds the feds. The framers were not worried about what the states were going to do. It says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, right? But Massachusetts could. Why doesn't the Bill of Rights restrict that? Well, because they thought that the Massachusetts Bill of Rights did a good enough job of restricting the uh, Massachusetts legislature. So, okay, so that was the original um, federalism idea. And just to get a few kind of uh, ideas on the table, why? Why would you want the feds to do few things and the states to do um, uh, most things? Well, there was the idea of laboratories of democracy. So it's the idea that, um, you know, if you had 13 or even 50 different governments trying to take a crack at policy questions, then maybe one of them would hit on some great idea. And then that great idea could be imitated by the others. That's one idea. And then um, a somewhat related idea, maybe actually the states might have different preferences. There might be heterogeneous preferences. So maybe Massachusetts likes you know, high taxes and lots of services, and North Carolina likes low taxes and not as many services. And if your preference doesn't match up with your state, you could move to another state, and we could get a variety of different uh, answers. So those are some of the ideas for federalism, that you could move to the state with the policy mix you liked, and so forth. OK, so um, the strategies of the Constitution this limited list of powers in Article 1, Section 8. And then the point is underscored by the Tenth Amendment, which says, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. That is, the default rule is going to be state power, not federal power. Right? So if you can't find it in the list, then it's a state power, presumably. So that was the Tenth Amendment idea. Okay. So uh, that was the original constitutional structure and what was sort of originally imagined by the framers. But I'm just going to tell you briefly about a couple of developments since then, the important developments. So one is, as uh, Peter uh, referenced, um, the Commerce Clause. So the Commerce Clause is one of these powers in Article 1, Section 8. It says the Congress shall have power to regulate commerce among the several states. And uh, in a series of decisions, the Supreme Court has dramatically expanded the scope of that clause, dramatically. So uh, a couple of the logical moves, if you're interested. One is to say, well, that clause really embraces anything that substantially affects interstate commerce. So not just the regulation of the interstate commerce, but of things that substantially affect it. That's a crucial analytical move, right? And then the second crucial analytical move is not whether any given activity substantially affects interstate commerce, but whether any given activity, when aggregated with all other similar activity out in the world, whether that substantially affects interstate commerce. And the answer to that is it almost always does, right? Once, you do, once you're done aggregating, it almost always does have some effect on interstate commerce. So. Thus, we get Congress's power to do virtually anything. So that's the kind of innovation that brings us to, what I'm trying to do here is lay out the sort of framework that brings us to this tension, tension between the administrative state and federalism. So these ideas, the federalism was uh, kind of a framing era idea. The administrative state puts pressure on that. I'm trying to show you that pressure developed. The Commerce Clause uh, move is maybe the first uh, reason. So, okay, the, um, the congressional power grew vastly. Okay, now, 
So these agencies, so th then uh, Congress created all kinds of agencies that do all kinds of things that are things that the framers would not have imagined the federal government doing, but the, uh, they're justified on the theory that they have some relation to interstate commerce, so we get the growth of all of these agencies. Okay. Now we get tension with another constitutional principle. The Constitution says that the president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Okay, so what does that mean? First of all, notice that it's not the president shall himself faithfully execute the laws. That would be impossible. He's got to have underlings. So what he's going to do is take care that they be faithfully executed. What can that mean? You know, what it basically means is he's going to have underlings and he's got to be able to tell those underlings what to do, right? Tell those officers what to do. Go do X, right? And, but the rubber hits the road when one of those officers says no, says I'm not going to do that thing. And the way the president manages to take care that the laws be faithfully executed is he has to have the power to fire that person. So the person says no, and then the president fires that person, and then they, he hires someone who says yes, and then that's how the president takes care of the laws that be faithfully executed. But in a Supreme Court case called Humphrey's Executor, the Supreme Court said, well, yeah, that's true and right in for kind of core executive activities, and so there are many, um, there are many uh, officers who indeed the president does have to have the power to fire at will, but the heads of some of these agencies are really doing kind of quasi-legislative uh, or quasi-judicial things. And as to them, the president doesn't quite have to have that same level of power. So those folks, uh, it, the court held that it was OK for Congress to say that some of those folks could be fireable by the president only for cause. That is, he can't fire them at will. And so that gives these agencies, the heads of these agencies, and thus the agencies themselves, some level of independence as against the president. Okay. So that's a second thing that puts some of these ideas into tension. Um, and third, uh, the, um, these agencies are doing these things that look quasi-legislative. So uh, Congress passes laws that are very vague, and then agencies pass regulations, which in theory are fleshing out the extremely vague terms of the statute, and in practice, you know, are looking really a lot like legislation. And uh, you might have thought that uh, that was in tension with yet another constitutional provision, the provision that the legislative power shall be vested in a Congress of the United States. The non-delegation doctrine said, you know, Congress can't give away its legislative powers. It can't have folks other than Congress legislating. But um, so when Congress passes a very vague statute, what the agency is doing can look a lot like legislation. You might have thought that was unconstitutional, but the court has said um, it's okay as long as what the Congress says has an intelligible principle. So as long as it's not too vague, it's okay for agencies to do a lot of the uh, fleshing out. And these developments are the developments that put a lot of pressure on federalism, right? So we get Congress doing, we get the federal government doing a lot of things that uh, the framers imagined the states would do. So we get a lot of pressure put on federalism, okay. Now these developments, the Humphreys executor development, the vast expanse of the Commerce Clause, the internment of the non-delegation doctrine, these are developments which I dare say um, some of us here on this panel and some of you out in the audience think are uh, bad. But they are, uh, unfortunately, water under the bridge. And so it actually, they raise the question, which is quite a difficult question for people like Randy Barnett and Michael McConnell, about how, a, how an originalist should uh, deal with these things. Um, how are you to vindicate federalism principles in a world in which these sort of three things have already happened? 
it. Now, you can take the position, as an academic, you could take the position that you think we should just get rid of these things, like we should you know, turn back from Humphrey's executor and roll back you know, Wicker v. Filburn and things. You can take that position. It's very unlikely that the court is going to do that. It's possible, but very unlikely. And so you're left with a set of sort of second best questions. How should an originalist think about um, something like federalism in a world in which the administrative state is just a fact on the ground? And I think my fellow panelists are going to talk a bit about that. And so I just wanted to uh, lay some groundwork <coughs> for you. We're in the second best world of trying to vindicate federalism principles while we already have this administrative state, I think. So first I must say it's a great honor to be here and a great pleasure because this is my hometown. When I got off the train, I walked over to say hello to the regicides behind the center church. Um, they're long dead, but in my imagination, they're still alive, lurking somewhere in the woods in, in, on West Rock. Uh, now, I, I have two points today, two fairly simple points, although they become complex in the details. Um, the first point uh, concerns the administrative conflict with federalism. And I won't deal with the whole topic, it's huge, but I want to focus on administrative rules and how they conflict with state laws and if there's a problem there. And then second, I'd like to talk about civil liberties, because if we get to the question uh, that Nick raised, well, what are you going to do about this? One solution is to stop thinking about this simply in terms of federalism or separation of powers and to begin thinking about it in terms of civil liberties. Then one begins to get a little traction. So let's begin with the first my first argument, which is that federal administrative rules do not bind the states, do not render state law unlawful. Now that may seem as a bit of a shock if one's read the last uh, century or so of Supreme Court cases. Maybe it's just an ideal. But it's something we need to keep in mind when talking about federalism, because at the very least, even if doctrine doesn't change dramatically, it sets a baseline from which we're have to we can understand from which we can begin to understand the problem. So let's just begin by asking why are federal statutes binding on anybody, whether us individually or on the states? Um, I think we can begin to understand this in the same way the founders did. Um, statutes are enacted not only under a constitution adopted by the people, um, but also by representatives of the people in a legislative body our representatives whom we choose and whom we can get rid of. We're each personally disappointed with each election. Some get something we want, something we don't want, but we get to vote for our, the people who make our laws. And that's profoundly important because that is what traditionally was understood to give statutes their binding quality, their ability to create legal obligation, both for us personally and then for the states too. It's one of the great innovations of the federal constitution that it does this, it binds the states. You know, we, Madison in 1782 thought to, to get the states to do what Congress wants, perhaps we have to send military force. But no, we just go to court and the courts enforce the law. So how are administrative rules different? Well, administrative rules are not made in Congress. Uh, they're made by members of the executive branch or independent agencies, by persons who are not elected and are largely unremo unremovable. Uh, and this is a little different. There's a, it doesn't power, it's not power from the people. And so, at least in theory, it doesn't bind us as individuals and it doesn't bind the states. Um, interestingly, the Constitution recognizes all of this. Uh, Article one, the, the first substantive words of the Constitution, all legislative powers here and granted are, are in the Congress of the United States. All legislative powers. Um, why is that word there? Um, it, if this were a permissive grant such that other bodies could exercise the legislative powers, you wouldn't need the word all, right? Um, it's a signal that this is an exclusive grant to Congress, not to other bodies. But we can go further, for example, to the Supremacy Clause, and this is an argument, by the way, borrowed from a brilliant former colleague of mine, Brad Clark at GW. Um, the, supreme, the Supremacy Clause defines what law is supreme, law, and this includes laws made in pursuance of the Constitution. Um, administrative rules are not made in pursuance of the Constitution. They're made in pursuance of statutes, 
not of the Constitution. Um, so these are, even the, if you look at the text of the Supremacy Clause, it embodies this assumption that these other rules, the ones not made by, co by Congress, are not binding on the states. Um, so I don't think administrative rules really defeat state law. Now, of course, there's a counter-argument, a very reasonable counter-argument. What binds the states, actually, are the statutes that authorize administrative rules. And administrative rules are merely executive specification of what's generally stated in the statute. It's a very nice, it's a very clever argument. The problem is that it's entirely fictional and has long been recognized as fictional. I'll just quote James Landis, uh, writing in the 1930s. He explained, it's obvious that the resort to administrative process is not, as some suppose, simply an extension of executive power. Um, and those who have sought to liken this development to a pervasive use of executive power are simply, and I see his words, confused. Uh, so I'm happy to rely on James Landis on this. Now, current doctrine, is the opposite of what I've told you. So why am I worrying about this? Why bother spend all this time explaining why it's actually different from current doctrine? And I think the best way to understand this is to actually ask each of you to consider, are you worried? Are you worried about the degree of alienation in our society about our government? Uh, both on the left and on the right, there's profound alienation, profound discontent deep rumblings, and some of it you might think is rather shallow, but the pro problem sociologically is very deep. And we should all worry about this, regardless of our political point of view. And if you're worried about that alienation, one thing I think one needs to worry about is that we have taken a republic and created within it an entirely different system of government that is not accountable to the people. We do not make, uh, we do not elect the people who make our laws anymore. On the, Yes, that's the shell, but the substance of most legislation at the federal level comes in agencies that are not elected. So if you take the alienation problem seriously, even if you discount all the political theory of the founders, but you care about the sociology of current America, you need to worry about administrative power. And even if you're an advocate of administrative power, you should consider perhaps don't play that hand too hard because there'll be backlash that you will find unpleasant and that you think problematic. Now, do I have a few minutes left, I think? Yes. Uh, so I'd like to switch gears a little bit. This panel is about administrative power and federalism. That's an important topic. But I think it's a grave error to look at this problem narrowly in terms of little boxes like federalism, separation of powers, delegation. That's all well and good. But instead, what I'd like to do is talk about this in terms of civil liberties. Because that is the key thing that we need to worry about with administrative power. What am I talking about? How could this be a matter of civil liberties? Well, let's just take, for example, equal voting rights. In the past, since the Civil War, there have been two central developments in American law. One, equal voting rights, first for blacks, then for women, and then really for blacks in the 1960s. And the other one has been administrative power. And I'm not the first person to note that very oddly, administrative power seems to increase after each extension of voting rights. So what I'd like to ask is, is there a connection? And of course, there is. Uh, the reality is that uh, the knowledge class, this is a matter of class rather than politics, the knowledge class of which we're all members, has, as a whole, welcomed equal voting rights and then regretted the results. And the solution has been, at the same time that you extend voting rights to minorities, you withdraw legislative power out of Congress, the elected body, into the hands of people, well, you know, like oneself. Um, this is not just, uh, you know, this is not just hamburger speaking. Let me quote one of the founders of the administrative state, Woodrow Wilson. Others later learned to talk about this less candidly, but Woodrow Wilson, bless his heart, was quite candid. And remember, these are his words, don't attribute this to me, goodness gracious. Um, he said the reformer, meaning the progressive reformer, is bewildered by the need to persuade a voting majority of several million heads. And then he <coughs> explains that he's particularly worried about the diversity of the nation. He says, because this means the reformer needs to influence the mind not only of Americans of the older stocks only, um, but also of Irishmen, Germans, and Negroes. And then he elaborates, the bulk of mankind is rigidly unphilosophical, and nowadays the bulk of mankind votes. That disturbs him. He's an admirer of Bismarck, as you can tell. And where is this unphilosophical bulk of mankind more multifarious in its composition than in the United States? Accordingly, to get a footing for new doctrine, one must influence the minds cast in the mold of every race, minds inheriting every bias of environment, warped by the histories of a score of different nations, warmed or chilled, closed or expanded by almost every climate of the globe. 
I can go on and on quoting Woodrow Wilson, but you, you get the idea. Um, the administrative state was designed as a response to the diversity and seeming, uh, uh, the diversity of what Carlyle called the unwashed masses. And so if you wonder why people are upset about it, um, they haven't, may not have read Woodrow Wilson, but they, they get its implications. A part of those are racial, right? Much of the administrative state is run by white men. But I don't think ultimately it's about race. Ultimately, it's about class. And that is indeed part of the alienation that we see in our society today. If you worry about it, worry about equal voting rights because they've been essentially gutted quietly. Uh, it is the greatest bait and switch in American history. Second, if you're worried about civil liberties, what about those procedural rights? Most of the Bill of Rights consists of procedural rights, you know, juries, due process, self-incrimination, etc. These are also gutted by the administrative state. The administrative state allows the federal government to adjudicate, not merely in courts of law where you get all your rights, but also in administrative so-called tribunals uh, where you don't get most of these rights or just get watered down versions of them. And that changes the very nature of what it is to have a constitutional right in the procedural area. Procedural rights used to be guarantees. It's a guarantee because you're guaranteed to get it. But the government now can act ambidextrously. It can move against you in a court or in an administrative tribunal. And that means that what once were guarantees for the people are now merely options of power for the government. It can give you your rights in court or it can take another path and whoopee, no rights. Uh, and finally, um, this has consequences for substantive rights. And here the First Amendment is particularly important. Uh, it's important in the area of religious liberty, perhaps most important for freedom of speech. Uh, three, no problem. Uh, three minutes will do. Uh, if you look at the development of the freedom of speech, it began most centrally as a freedom from administrative licensing. That was the 18th century vision of what's most important in freedom of speech, no administrative licensing. And lip services pay to this even up to the current day in treatises. But it has come back. More than a half dozen agencies license speech. HHS licenses academic speech and research through institutional review boards. The FEC licenses political speech through advisory opinions. Um, the FCC licenses speech on the airwaves, and so on and so forth. Licensing of speakers and speech is now pervasive. So whether you care about equal voting rights, procedural rights, or substantive rights such as free speech, you should worry about the administrative state. And this, I'm glad to say, is actually an opportunity because in response to this, uh, there, are, there is a chance to litigate with a new style of civil liberties uh, litigation um, for, on behalf of rights that affect all of us, regardless of our race, our creed, our nationality, to protect the rights we have that are specified in the Constitution and that have been destroyed by the administrative state. So thank you. Um, I would just want to add, finally, that if you're interested in this, at the back of the room and, and up here, I have free copies of a tiny little booklet um, that will either put you to sleep or may interest you. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, um, uh, in particular this organization named after one of my own heroes, as so many of us have mentioned today, William F. Buckley, Jr. Um, while it's not quite on point, I just can't waste the opportunity to urge all students in this room, um, if there's one book you're going to read before you leave college and move on to your careers, read William F. Buckley, Jr.'s memoir, a compilation came out in 2004 called Miles Gone By, which is an account of not just politics, but also life well lived. Um, I especially recommend the audiobook version, which Buckley himself reads, uh, so it's a treasure. Um, and one more, I would urge you uh, to read an essay he published near the end of his life in the Atlantic Monthly called Away, like um, uh, boating. Um, it's the loveliest essay he wrote in his life and, and thus one of the loveliest essays that we'll ever read. Um, so as Professor Shook mentioned, I, uh, I have the pleasure of directing a program at the Antonin Scalia Law School called the Center for the Study of the Administrative State. And when we talk about the administrative state, um, what we tend to have in mind in our program is the basic state of our governance today, one that's dominated first and foremost by administrative agencies uh, in the practical workings of day-to-day -day government. Um, to be honest, I don't want an administrative state. Um, we, do need, we do need administrative agencies, and I think there's a big difference. Um, our Constitution presupposes the existence of agencies, or departments as they're called in the Constitution, and I think it presupposes pretty powerful agencies. 
Um, in Federalist 70, Alexander Hamilton famously defends an energetic executive branch. And we tend to think about that in terms of foreign policy, national defense, and so on. But Hamilton takes care to stress at the very outset he's talking not just about foreign affairs, but also domestic governance. He says energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. He talks about foreign affairs a bit, but then he returns and says, it is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws. And you see, when you look at the laws that the very first Congress passed, it passes some tax bills, of course, because it is Congress. Um, but as soon as it gets that out of the way, it begins the hard work of creating administrative departments, the original cabinet departments, and delegating, uh, or, that's sort of a loaded word, um, empowering them, you know, writing statutes that vest significant power in those original departments. Because as already has been mentioned, that's necessary uh, for the actual operation of day-to-day -day governance. But at the same time, we want to remain a truly Republican government uh, in the form that Madison and Hamilton and the others stressed. Uh, a Republican government that's subject to the rule of law and ultimately accountable to the people through their elected representatives. So when Madison writes in Federalist 10, um, he, he concedes the existence of illnesses, necessarily uh, part of democracy. He says the remedy that we behold for these illnesses are not a bureaucratic remedy or a judicial remedy, but they are a Republican remedy, namely looking for ways in the structure and operation of our government to, as he would later explain in Federal 51, allow ambition to counteract ambition, have the branches check and balance one another so that within the context of elected government uh, and the rule of law through the courts, we can have a truly limited government. And federalism was an important part of that. So when I talk about the administrative state and administrative law, my basic point is it's a task of striking a balance. Uh, this is a point that Justice Scalia made in 1983 before he was Justice Scalia in a very short essay in a law review. He was talking about the, the intersection of law, politics, and administration. And he says that we sometimes tend to forget in these subjects that is more a matter of resolving tensions than drawing lines. And what I take him to mean is that on questions of administration, within these very broad constitutional limits, very important constitutional limits like delegation and accountability to the president. Uh, but within those limits, there's a lot of room for play in the joints. And the question, and Scalia knew it firsthand, he wrote a lot about this before he was a judge, when he was a professor, a lowly think tank scholar, he looked for ways to strike a right balance between these competing interests and values of Republican government. And as it happens, He's, uh, he wrote the same way or spoke the same way about federalism sometimes. Um, 35 years ago, the Federal Society had its inaugural conference on federalism right here at Yale, at the Yale Law School. And uh, then Professor Scalia gave a talk on federalism. And the talk was later published under the title, The Two Faces of Federalism. And I'd urge you to look it up because he stressed that actually, or he sort of stressed it in a, in a conference focused on the need to devolve power to the states. He wanted to stress the need to also focus on the, the, the good things that our national government does and why it is an important aspect of federalism. And he says, in a meeting to discuss federalism, we have to bear in mind that it is a form of government midway between two extremes. At one extreme, uh, the autonomy, disunity, and conflict of independent states, and at the other, the uniformity, inflexibility, and monotony of one centralized government. Uh, federalism is meant to be a compromise between the two, and then a characteristic of Scalia flair he says, as such, it is a stick that can be used to beat either dog. And what he means is federalism means empowering the federal government to do the right things within its proper role, and the same with the states, empowering the states to do their proper job in their proper role, and to set the two often against one another in service of both good government uh, and liberty. But it wasn't just Scalia who saw this way. In preparing for this talk, I went back to some of Buckley's writings. Um, when I was in your shoes in college, I wrote my, my senior economics paper on uh, the debates in the late 90s over internet sales tax, e-commerce tax. And Buckley wrote on everything, so of course he wrote on this too. And there's a fun line in there. He says, since the 1930s, the policies that have come from the national government have been policies that conservatives, oh wait, no, sorry, that's a Scalia line. He says, the mere thought of calculations required to straighten out all of this in terms of the balance of power between the federal government and state governments over e-commerce taxes, it renews our gratitude to the founders who acknowledged that in some questions, not many but some, only a central voice can effectively write policy. And so Buckley too harkens back to this heritage we have uh, of, of 
valuing national power in service of the things properly within the ambit of national government, namely interstate commerce rightly understood uh, first and foremost. And so again, it's a question not absolutes, I think, but about striking balances and finding the proper role for both federal government and state, uh, and state government. So we move to the administrative state and federalism, and we can mean that in two ways. In this context, we could talk about administrative law and federalism, administrative policy and federalism, and I'll touch briefly on both of them. First, administrative law. Um, administrative law is often a proxy war for much greater debates that we have in this nation, and we've already discussed several of them. Fights over the powers that Congress delegates to the agencies. Uh, debates over due process, over civil liberties, over federalism. And of course those debates should and will inform debates over administrative law. Um, but I'd say there's only so much that administrative law can do to solve those debates. These are debates that are much bigger than administrative law. And as the courts and the people sort these things out on a broader scale, that's how these, th these values will be sort of ultimately found in administrative law. But they're not going to be solved first and foremost through administrative law. Um, but there's some things that the courts can do and I think should do. Um, in terms of Chevron deference, the doctrine under which courts often defer to agencies' interpretation of ambiguous statutes, and they're mostly ambiguous, um, I think that values of federalism can be used to much greater effect as the courts decide whether to grant Chevron deference. And I won't wade into the details here, but among judges, among law professors, there's debates over how to properly box in Chevron deference. And I think courts pausing at the outset to consider the federalism implications of a particular program is one sort of antecedent step you can take in a, in a regulatory case to sort of promote the value of federalism in the work of the judges. Second, this has been touched on the question of preemption. Uh, Congress's laws preempt state laws. Agencies' regulations often preempt state laws. I think the court should be more rigorous uh, in reviewing these regulations uh, and probably be restrain, the court should do more to restrain agencies from making regulations that purport to preempt federal law. Um, but like I said, I think there's only so much that administrative law can do to promote federalism. The, cause, the causal relationship really is the other way around. I would focus on administrative policy in federalism because I think there's a lot that can be done in that realm to promote federalism. It's already been mentioned that we think of the states often as laboratories of democracy, uh, but they're not very good at it uh, in this day and age. The states don't do enough to really serve as laboratories of democracy. And we can blame the federal government for sort of encroaching on the state's turf, and that's that's true to some extent, but as I'll say, I'll return to later, the real problem is that the states don't defend their turf enough. And I don't just mean defending it in court, I mean defending it by actually working to promote interesting and innovative policies that inspire other states to follow suit and that encourage the courts to defend the state's turf and that actually give the Congress a reason to take a step back. Um, there's so many areas where states could be doing more to be innovative, whether it's welfare policy, um, something that Professor Shook has written on in a, uh, a journal I particularly admire and I hope you look for, National Affairs, a great policy quarterly. Welfare policy, education policy, even energy and environmental policy, which is the subject of what we usually call cooperative federalism. These national programs like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act that bring the states in in a very significant way to administer federal policy. These are all areas where the states could be doing a lot more and thinking much more creatively. But the fact is they don't. The states tend not to take initiative on this outside of lawsuits. Um, they're very reactive um, and they seem very too often they seem content to serve as the branch office for federal regulators, whether it's the EPA or other agencies like that. I think the state regulators need to think for themselves, and I don't mean collectively the states as a whole, I mean individual states. Too often another problem with, with the states and federalism is they sort of band together and imitate one another. You'll have sort of a red state version of a regulatory program and a blue state version of a regulatory program. I think that's not really creative uh, enough and it doesn't do enough to really serve as a laboratory of democracy. Um, only by taking proactive steps being innovative and, and promoting demonstrably effective policy programs will states begin to present a credible alternative to national regulation. Um, in this I'm reminded of, of Madison in Federalist 51 where he talks about uh, federalism uh, and the separation of power, or Federalist 51 is about separation of powers, but he says ambition must be made to counteract ambition. One of the problems we're having at the national level right now is Congress is not ambitious enough 
uh, relative to the other branches. I'd say the same is true for federalism. The states just simply aren't ambitious enough in formulating regulatory policy. Um, and in closing, I think of a, a famous line, again, from a separation of powers context from uh, Justice Robert H. Jackson in a famous case. If you go to law school, you'll read it, called the Steel Seizure Case. Jackson is talking about the proper allocation of power between the president and the other parts of government. And he says, in terms of Congress, the courts might help to protect Congress's turf, but in the end, only Congress can allow power. It can, only Congress can keep power from slipping through its own fingers. And the same is true of the states. It, the problem here, I'll just say one last time, is not that the federal agencies are encroaching upon the states so much that the states are not defending their own turf and using their own turf uh, to the best possible effect. Thank you. Well, our speakers were uncharacteristically uh, modest in their use of time. Uh, so we have uh, about eight minutes left for Q&A from the audience. Um, and we have microphones nearby for those who want to speak. Thank you. Thanks, all, for great presentations. Please, please identify yourself before you ask your question. Oh, sure. Henry Capel, local attorney and even worse, government employed. Nonetheless, <laughs> um, in seeking to pare back the excesses of the administrative state, how does one begin to overcome the what I would think of the tremendously powerful circumstances that favor its maintenance and expansion? I'm thinking of two. One is there's a tremendously large number of jobs and careers, vested interest, that benefit just from its existence, who work for it and the ancillary uh, agencies around it. And secondly, uh, the ec economic problem of you have highly concentrated benefits that often accrue to a highly motivated few from various administrative rulings versus highly dispersed costs that are barely felt by any one individual among the rest of us that bear that cost. How do we get past that politically in order to um, reform the administrative state? Is that question directed at any particular panelist? Anyone uh, so, uh, for what it's worth, uh, although I argue against uh, binding administrative rules, I wish the agencies wouldn't attempt that, um, I have nothing against administrators. In fact, I think we should pay them double if they promise not to do it again. Um, <laughs> at which point, you see, so I don't think one has to think of it simply as dismantling people's jobs and pensions and the like. It, that's, and many agencies actually have some expertise, uh, not all of them, but some have a genuinely advanced expertise, and that could be valuable in making proposals to Congress. So it, it needn't be an us versus them kind of thing. Um, as to how to overcome <coughs> entrenched interests, uh, I suppose it's worth keeping in mind that, of course, the administrative state or administrative power has a lot of costs in destroying a lot of people's jobs, too. Um, so it, where the balance lies, I don't know. And um, then finally, uh, ultimately, the appeal has to be to the judges. Um, on terms that they take seriously, even with current doctrine. And that's why I think a civil liberties angle actually is quite significant. They do care about their role as judges. They do care about due process. They do care about juries and the like. Didn't Reagan once say that the closest thing we'll ever have to eternal life on earth is the existence of a government program? Um, it's very hard to, to come up with, a, with, 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 with you know, broad ways or bold ways to roll back agencies or regulatory programs, but there are some small ways. Um, one thing that I, I think the conservatives need to focus more on is the example we saw in the environmental movement. Uh, they promoted a, a, a theme called environmental justice. Um, in environmental programs, uh, the agencies are required to look out, not just for costs and benefits in general, but for ways in which the burdens of a regulatory action fall disproportionately on a particular disfavored or vulnerable community. And environmental justice has been taken to mean over the years primarily um, the impact of, of environmental programs or energy projects on, um, on poor uh, or minority groups. And those are important. Um, I think conservatives, rather than pushing against environmental justice, would do better to promote environmental justice rightly understood. Right? Look for other groups that are disproportionately bar burdened are particularly vulnerable to the cost of a regulatory program, identify them, highlight them, and in the context of the regulatory program itself, try to find ways to mitigate those costs. And I'm not just limiting this now to environmental justice. I think it's something that could be done much more broadly. Now, we already do have the Small Business Administration, which is supposed to do some of this, but which is actually pathetic and useless. So I understand that, that um, 
that maybe this is all being naive, but I do think conservatives could learn from this particular example. Uh, I might just say it's, it would be hard to do anything dramatic like get rid of an agency for exactly the reasons you describe, but what one can do and what actually this administration has been um, quite good at is uh, rolling back some of the crazier regulations. So um, that's a kind of unsung and quiet success of this administration, but some of the craziest regs are quietly going away. Um, another question from the audience? My name is John Wilson. I'm a retired veterinarian. Uh, my question is, how do we deal with the situation that exists today where the administrative state is opposed to the duly elected executive branch? And you, what's resulting in a plethora of uh, leaks, and how how do you, how does can the government function uh, under those conditions? I have some thoughts on this. I'm actually, I think that was a horrifying trend we saw in the first couple of months of the administration, the self-styled resistance movement. In a way, I'm disappointed that they started to trim their sails because I think if they had actually begun continue to follow through on their threats to stifle everything we might have actually seen a moment that would have created the political energy for real civil service reform. And I think it's time for real civil service reform. It's funny though, this actually, it's not as new a problem as we think. Um, my colleague at the Hoover Institution, Neil Ferguson, has a great new memoir out about Henry Kissinger. It's a funny little anecdote in the middle. Kissinger visits Arthur Schlesinger in the early days of the Kennedy administration, asks how things are going, and Schlesinger complains that the energetic initiatives of the Kennedy administration are already being bogged down by the, um, by the bureaucracy of the administrative agencies. Uh, Schlesinger has a line like, so much for the new frontier. Um, and James Burnham wrote about this in his books on Congress and on administration. So it's not, it's needless to say, it's not a new, it's not a new issue, um, but I do think it's taken on sort of astonishing um, urgency. Uh, so you, you could imagine a system in which uh, all, all government employees were sort of at will employees and when a new administration came in he sort of fired them all and brought in all of his own people and the thought is well first of all that would be hugely inefficient and uh, the kind of turnover would be very um, discombobulating and uh, it would end up being easily patronage jobs for the folks who had supported the campaign, and so it would be bad in a number of ways is the theory. Um, and But so what we've ended up with as our compromise is a actually very thin layer at the top of political appointees, and then vast, vast numbers of civil service employees who have, um, you know, civil service type tenure protections. And um, yeah, I think there's a quite a good case to be made that at least that layer ought to be a good bit thicker than it is. In a lot of these offices, there's like one political person and then a huge pyramid of, politi of uh, a career people. If, if I just add a little bit to these wise thoughts, I, I just say I, I think a coordinated and orderly White House could raise this issue and win it if it actually devoted enough time to think like IJ, the Institute for Judge Justice. Because the reality is, I don't know if any of you know what it's like inside the Federal Civil Service. There are wonderful people and some who are not. My sister, who is at a high level agency, uh, agency office, had to share office suite with a gentleman, if that's the right word, who spent most of his day on his computer looking at pornography and being paid a fine salary and getting a pension. And it just, it was so complicated to fire him, the solution was just to move to a different office. Now, I think a few examples like this, if sufficiently publicized, would allow the president just to fire one person, create a good test case. But I don't see that imagination currently. But I don't mean to, can I just add one, one last point to that? That in the current administration, one of its greatest failings, I think, has been its reluctance to energetically fill that top layer of political appointments. The problem has not exclusively been the Senate, although the Senate is a problem. The problem has been the administration, a problem has been the administration not filling those jobs quickly enough because of inertia, because of concerns, you know, all the, the multiple layers of vetting. That top layer of political appointees is the transmission belt from, for energetic, uh, for the energy of the executive to go from the president into the bureaucracy. 
And uh, the failure of this administration to do this at the outset as fast as possible and fill those seats might prove to be one of the biggest um, examples of, of the administration shooting itself in the foot in its first year. Last question. My name is Michael Skoll. I was uh, 30 years in the U.S. Foreign Service, and one of the lessons I learned over and over again was that the, uh, the most effective senior politicians, White House people, uh, were the ones who recognized immediately all of the experience that was represented in the, uh, in the bureaucracy and used it and used it effectively. And on the other hand, the most effective senior bureaucrats in my agency, the State Department and other agencies were those who wanted to follow the lead of the top people in the new administration and, and reached out and showed them that they were capable of following the lead. I could go on with example after example of senior people on both sides, politicians and bureaucrats, who were able to do that. And in each case, the policy was better, it was more effectively administered, and the, the country, I think, was better off for it. Uh, does anybody want to comment? I don't doubt that there are lots of examples like that, and uh, there should be, and it's terrific that there are such civil servants. But, you know, it's a really a quite a distinct mindset, the mindset that's extremely competent and has a lot of expertise and yet doesn't mind shifting 180 degrees and when uh, administration changes. It's game to kind of follow the lead of whatever the political, um, you know, whatever the political agenda may be. Even if, so you have to imagine someone who's extremely competent and motivated at doing their job even and yet not so committed to an ideological outcome or methodological outcome that they're willing to move 180 degrees with a change in administration. There are such people, and I've worked with such people, and they're fantastic, but they're not as many, I don't think, as you describe. Well, it's rarely 180 degrees. I've never experienced Well, maybe at the EPA these days. I must say, uh, maybe even the State Department. I, I, I confess, so an old 17th century adage uh, was, uh, people are policy, and I think that's still true. Um, it's It's discouraging. There are noble examples where that's not true, and I admire that. Um, but the reality is, if one has different policies as a result of elections, perhaps there should be some room to carry those out. Well, our official time is over, but I'm sure the speakers would be happy to entertain uh, questions or comments uh, after the session. Uh, I, w I, w I wanted to raise one question, but we're sort of out of time, but maybe uh, they can spend 20 seconds or 30 seconds uh, pondering it, which is uh, why uh, should liberals and moderates, as distinguished from Federalist Society conservatives, be as concerned as you are about the expansion of the administrative state and some of the pathologies you've described? Uh, liberals tend to want to expand government, and uh, the administrative state is the vehicle for doing that. But are there uh, deeper concerns that ought to uh, create anxiety on their part? Well, Anybody? Well, yes. I mean, I, I thought it was quite odd that um, a lot of Democrat senators were attacking um, Gorsuch's view on Chevron. I would, I would have thought that they'd be nervous about the idea of courts deferring to executive agencies, which were going to be Trump's agencies. So I. I actually thought it was, I mean, I think they were just reflexively objecting to whatever he was in favor of, but I, I would have thought that, yeah, that uh, liberals would be um, alarmed at some of these uh, um, trends, w at least when the administration doesn't favor them. Two thoughts. Um, first, as a pr preliminary matter, I can't help thinking that the Federalist Society includes many people who are profoundly moderate. Um, and profoundly liberal in the best ways. And so I hate that these words become divisive. Um, set, uh, but more substantively, yes, I do think you're absolutely right. Liberals should be concerned about this. And I think the civil liberties question uh, points the way. Uh, do liberals really want to give up on equal voting rights, making it just sort of part of a bait and switch? Do they really want to give up on procedural rights? And do they want to give up on free speech? I don't think in the long term that's in the interest of liberals um, or of anyone else in this country. 
A few months ago, I had the opportunity, the honor of testifying before the Senate Commerce Committee. It was right on the, the heels of President Trump's initial executive orders on entry into the United States from, from predominantly Muslim nations. And I watched Democratic senator after Democratic senator complain about the breadth of power being wielded by the president. And then they turned around to talk about the subject of the actual hearing, which is about uh, the dangers of overdelegation of power to agencies. And on that issue, they all seemed perfectly comfortable. Um, and they, they didn't seem, if they noted the irony of all of this, they didn't, they didn't mention it. I think that the, perhaps the one way to get progressives more interested in actually reforming, modernizing, and improving the agencies is to convince them that perhaps President Trump uh, isn't the last uh, Trump, sort of, the, he's not the last president who will govern in a sort of Trumpist way. And if they think that President Trump and his approach is the future of conservative governance, they might suddenly start to appreciate the need for more checks and balances uh, and restraint of executive power and administrative power. Well, please join me in thanking our panel.